do feel free to post questions or comments uh, during the presentation in the Zoom chat room, which I'll be monitoring. I can't begin to express what an absolute pleasure it is to once again serve as the U.S. Chair for both the RDCA SIG and the Torrance Roundtable portions of this conference. As you've probably read in the program, the RDCA SIG uh, will address creative ways to address dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia, and the, uh, the Torrance Roundtable on Creative Thinking Keynoters will speak to the theme 70 Years of Research into Creativity, Reflections on J.P. Guilford's uh, APA Presidential Address. Uh, but before I go and continue down that path, I, I just take, allow me to take a moment to, to thank James O'Gunley and the conference convener, well, as the conference convener, and his KIE uh, team for his and their continued outstanding and most appreciated efforts in convening the 2020 KIE conference. Uh, please let James know as you interact with him individually how much we all appreciate all of his and his team's efforts. This is my seventh KIE conference, London, Riga, Istanbul, Berlin, Philadelphia, Prague, Dubai, and now due to COVID times, the first completely virtual KIE conference. I know the yeoman effort and the time the team put and continues to put into making each conference unique, powerful, and worthwhile. Our keynoters and speakers today are superb. You are in for a treat. To start, allow me to introduce you to Dr. Lori Severino, our keynote speaker for the Reisman Diagnostic Creativity Assessment and Special Interest Group, and Dr. Frederica Freddy Reisman, the panelist who will respond to Lori's keynote. Uh, Dr. Lori Severino is an assistant professor and director mm, in Drexel University School of Education's special education programs. She teaches and researches in the areas of reading and high incidence disabilities, with her area of expertise being in reading disabilities. Prior to her arrival at Drexel, uh, Lori taught as a special education teacher in public education for 26 years, working with children from first through 12th grade. Uh, most of her teaching career has in fact been spent working with students with dyslexia. In addition to holding her K-12 principal certification, Lori is a member of the Instructional Strategies Committee of the Philadelphia Read by Fourth Campaign and a level one and two certified Wilson language trainer, who also teaches the Wilson coursework in addition to offering professional development opportunities in the Philadelphia region to schools and school districts. Working with a team of researchers, she developed a iPad app that assesses adolescent reading comprehension that is currently being piloted in the tri-state area of Philadelphia, which makes more sense if you happen to be from Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia area. Uh, she is a sought after speaker and along with her panelists today, Dr. Reisman uh, co-presents as uh, invited speakers on the intersection of dyslexia and creativity, which not so coincidentally was the impetus of their co-authored book, uh, currently in press on dyslexia, dysgraphia and dyscalculia. Uh, the other speaker will be Dr. Frederica Reisman, a, a, in addition to being founder of Drexel School of Education and its creativity and, and innovation programs, is Emerita Professor and co-director of the Drexel Torrance Center for Creativity and Innovation. Prior to her arrival to Drexel in 1984, uh, Freddie served as professor and chair of the Division of Elementary Education at the University of Georgia, where she worked with her good friend and colleague, Dr. E. Paul Torrance. Uh, Freddie has an impressive record of external funding from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. and P Pennsylvania Departments of Education, and many other private foundations and organizations to assist pre- and in-service teachers in developing their creativity, mathematics, and technology skills. Uh, Freddie is author of several books with subjects that include diagnostic teaching, teaching mathematics to children with special needs, using creativity to assist dyslexia and dyscalculia, elementary education pedagogy, mathematics pedagogy, and application of creativity and innovation to uh, business and corporate situations. As her PhD is in the area of math education from Syracuse University, it seems apropos that she also co-authored a trilogy of books on teaching mathematics create, uh, creatively with the creativity scholar and researcher, E. Paul Torrance. Dr. Reisman is co-creator of the Reisman Diagnostic Creativity Assessment the RDCA, hence the special interest group. 
Uh, the RDCA, for those who aren't aware, is a self-report assessment of research-based traits of creative strengths based on the Torrance test of creativity. Uh, Freddie is the recipient of the National 2002 Champion of Creativity Award by the American Creativity Association. She served as its president from 2012 to 2017. And she received the 2017 National Association for Gifted Children's E. Paul Torrance Award, acknowledging her significant, uh, significant contributions to the field of creativity. In 2020, uh, Dr. Um, well, Drexel University, uh, in fact, renamed uh, our annual University Creativity Award as the Freddie Reisman University Creativity Award. And again, it's not Frederica Reisman, but the Freddie Reisman University Creativity Award. As shared previously, Freddie's most recent book, Currently Impressed with Rutledge and Due Out This Fall, was co-authored with Dr. Lori Severino. It is also the title of Lori's RDCA SIG presentation, Using Creativity to Address Dyslexia, Dysgraphia, and Dyscalculia, Assessments and Techniques. Take it away, Lori. Wow, what an introduction, Larry. <laughs> Thank perfect. you. And it has been a pleasure working with Freddie um, on the book that is going to be coming out. And I'm going to share some of that information with you. Let me share my screen. Okay. So as Larry said, uh, using creativity to enhance instruction for students with dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. So Freddie and I have been working a couple years on this um, because of my passion with dyslexia um, and her passion in math and creativity. It was just a perfect um, scenario for us to work together on this book. And we have been presenting um, for years before the book uh, also with Larry. So this is, this is a great opportunity. So thank you for having us. Um, you'll see in the lower left-hand corner, I do have some poll questions um, that I'm gonna ask you to respond to. So if you are on your computer and you wanna open up another uh, screen, you can go to pollev.com and then backslash Lori Severino 425. Or if on your phone, uh, text Lori Severino 425 to 37607. That'll come up on the screen again, but I just wanted to, if you wanted to start working on that, um, you could get that set up. Oh. Let me go back, hold on. It's, it's now going on a mind of its own. <laughs> okay, so if you would go to the poll, I just wanna find out um, who I'm speaking to so that maybe things that pop up I can specifically talk about things that relate to each person. And while we're waiting for responses to come in. Are, are people able to get on? Yeah, great. That's good, it means it's working. So I'm gonna be talking today about how you can use the RDCA and creative ways to teach for students specifically with learning disabilities dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. Give it another couple seconds. So college professors, PhD or EDD students, and somebody that doesn't fit my choices. So now if you would click on the map, tell me where you're from, because obviously people have been up for a long time because they've been <laughs> probably attending um, the different conferences and, and all over the place. So I know um, 
people are from a variety of different places, just trying to find out where we see people. Great, great, great. And it looks gonna be another long day for people I fear. So as we get started in this, um, I wanna talk about why we would wanna have creativity in schools. And um, Chu et al. in 2017 talked about why creativity is so important. It leads to development of critical thinking, problem solving, communication and collaboration. And it helps to develop accomplished, well-rounded citizens. And the standards in K-12 schools in the US are really around the top two, critical thinking and problem solving. And they are also the most sought after skills in the workforce right now. So to be developing this in our students while they're in school is critical to the jobs that are gonna be available once they are out of high school and starting and college and starting their careers. So really important to focus on developing that creativity in schools. And in 2018-19, Gallup did a study and the five findings that they came out with um, that they believe that creativity, so it was parents and teachers that responded to this poll and that um, it produced positive critical outcomes especially when they leveraged technology. And isn't that interesting in this, in the state that we're in now with COVID-19 that I think teachers are probably gonna bring in a lot more technology once they are face-to-face -face again. So um, that was essential. And also they believe that creativity inspired better outcomes than traditional methods. They don't see the value in standardized testing to measure learning. Um, which has its place, but not as much value as maybe in the United States is what we're placing on it. And then the green arrow, students spend little time on activities that foster creativity. So you see all these positive things that the outcomes for creativity, but not much time is being spent on it in the schools. Um, and that it does help to bring autonomy and, and people to think outside the box when you have that supportive collaborative culture. So all of those positives, the parents and teachers are seeing that it's a positive outcome, but they're not spending the time developing that creativity in the classroom. And so it may be even more important for students with dyslexia, dysgraphia or dyscalculia um, it may be even more important for those with those learning disabilities to expand and use their creativity to help them get through the issues that they have in learning when it comes to reading, writing, and math. Um, and this is just an example of, you know, where um, things happen in the brain and on the right side is where that those most of the creative impulses come from. And on the left side is where you see the academic side of things, things that are happening in school. And obviously we use all parts of our brains for things, but there are certain um, parts that we tend to lean on and for those creative outlets. And so, what well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens in the brain when you have dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. And you're going to see that it happens mostly, their thinking happens more on the right side. So cre using those creative strengths would be very um, advantageous. So just a quick true-false question if you're still in the app or um, online. Dyslexia is when people reverse letters, especially B and D. Is that true or false? We have some smart cookies in the group. <laughs> uh, so yes, it is 
it's a characteristic that can sometimes happen, but it is not what dyslexia is. So a lot, there are big myths that dyslexia is when you reverse letters. It can happen with some students with dyslexia, but it is not, um, it's more of a myth than it is true. Oops. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what dyslexia is, what dyscalculia is, what dysgraphia is. Probably the most commonly heard is dyslexia and it's learning difficulties with problems with accurate or fluent word recognition, poor decoding and poor spelling. The biggest takeaway is that it's neurobiological in origin. So when you learn to um, read, it focuses on these two areas of the left side of the brain you hear sounds and words, and then you have to take all of that information and then you have to learn to map that to letters and know the sounds of the letters and then putting that together to make words and it has to be mapped in your brain. And that's happening on the left side of the brain. And a lot of people with dyslexia, when they are trying to read, they are using, so there should be a quick highway pathway in the brain from reading to um, comprehension and to actually reading the words and spelling the words. And for most dyslexic students, it, they're using kind of a back road map in their brain. So if you picture um, country roads, they're going from the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain, back to the left side of the brain, back to the right side of the brain. They're not using a highway. They're using a bumpy back country road um, as they're learning to read. And so that, they don't know exactly what causes it. They do know that it is hereditary. So it could be, you know, passed on in the genes in the family. And, but it is definitely, happening in the brain and it's an unexpected issue so it's not a um, iq issue typically they are average to above average intelligence and it's unexpected that they have trouble reading same thing with if they have dyscalculia it's unexpected that they would have trouble with math because they're very bright seem to have um, a typical vocabulary. They can understand when they, when they hear things, but when it comes to the reading piece, that's where it breaks down, the reading and writing. And dysgraphia is difficulty with subword letter formation. So, and it's not a motor condition. That's been ruled out, but they're still having trouble. So they have use of their hands and their shoulders and their arms. It's not that kind of issue, but it's, they're still having trouble forming the letters. Um, and then it's also been expanded to include that their handwriting is illegible. It's very slow. It's difficult for them to spell. And then they also have problems with syntax and composition. And then dyscalculia makes it hard to make sense of numbers. So anything that has to do with remembering number facts, um, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, they're really gonna struggle with that. And again, um, still happening today, it's happened a lot in the past, but even still today, teachers will think the student is just lazy, giving up, not trying hard enough, it is not the case. When they have these issues, it's something in their brain that's not making those connections. And so is there a link between uh, creativity and mostly what's been studied is dyslexia. There haven't been studies on dysgraphia or dyscalculia. So what I'm gonna talk about here is specifically on dyslexia. And so you'll see that in some of these studies, it'll say boys with LD, so learning disabilities, or they've been developmental dyslexia. So um, developmental dyslexia is what we're talking about um, where it's 
because of something that's happening neurologically in their brain that they're still developing and learning. So back in 1992, they found a positive correlation between creativity and our interpersonal problem solving. So our kids with dyslexia are having these strengths. And then in 1997, um, developmental students with developmental dyslexia had a higher propensity for intuition aspects of creative thinking. And then in 1999, um, students with developmental dyslexia had higher levels of creativity on figural tests. And also in 2016, the um, statistically significant differences on widening, connecting, and reorganizing in students with developmental dyslexia. So while there's not a hard, fast, this is definitely a connection, there's a lot of support for the fact that students with dyslexia um, have strengths that even though they have issues in their reading, writing, or math, they have these other strengths that need to really be encouraged in school to help them persevere and have that grit to, to um, work through their struggles. So we're talking about some famous people that have been um, identified as having dyslexia. So Charles Branson, uh, Ansel Adams, Henry Winkler, Charles Schwab, and Jorn Utzon, who created uh, the architect that developed the Sydney Opera House. So what you see is these creative folks and thinkers outside the box, lots of them having dyslexia. And so in the United States, uh, 7.1 million students had special ed services. 33% of those had either dyslexia, dysgraphia, or dyscalculia, or a combination of two or three of them. So we're not talking about a small number of people, we're talking about 2.3 million. Um, and just as I mentioned earlier, this is a quote from Henry Winkler, School was this immovable object. I was told I wasn't living up to my potential, that I was stupid. I have heard that so many times from people, adults, that when they were going through school, the teachers were calling them stupid or lazy. Um, and again, it is still happening today. So um, I think if we could focus on their strengths and the things that they are really fantastic at, we could see that uh, they could create amazing things. There was also a study done, and I just want to check my time. There was a study done um, comparing entrepreneurs to corporate managers, and they found that 35% of the entrepreneurs had dyslexia, and less than 1% of corporate managers identified as having dyslexia. So that may be the skill set for the entrepreneur mindset also comes along with um, dyslexia. And how we can, how we can use the RDCA. So this group is very familiar with the RDCA and um, there's a link at the top if you haven't taken it in a while and you want to take it again to see where you are um, on that scale. But we can use this to help identify our students with dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. We can use this to determine what are their strengths and how can I then leverage that in the classroom. And so this is actually a student score. Um, but the first thing we would want is for teachers to take the assessment themselves because you want to find out what your own strengths are so that you can you know, start to work on some things that maybe you can expand on and then understand yourself so that when you're working with the students, you can help them also. Have the students take the RDCA and it is free, so anybody can take it. And then start incorporating some of their strengths into 
learning and activities. So just look at the score for this student on fluency and flexibility, right? It's so high. And, but then look at the extrinsic motivation, low. So if you're trying to encourage this student with extrinsic rewards to do something, probably not gonna work, right? So it's good to know where their strengths are and where they could care about some of these things. And so Torrance, all, back in 1979, set up a model for how we could do this to, we need to heighten their awareness, make them really curious about things, ask them to dig deeper and synthesize their learning, and then apply it to real world problems. Because that's where you're really going to see students with learning disabilities excel, is when they have to apply it to problems. And also a model for incorporating creativity in the classroom. So these are things that we've known for a long time. Look at these 1976, 1978, 1971. We know some of these things. So where does the RCDA fit? If we're assessing students on their academic abilities, why aren't we also assessing them on their creative abilities? Let's do it together, get that information, and then let's, where they have needs, you want to scaffold that learning. You want to use evidence-based teaching and then incorporate their creative strengths in that teaching. And then make sure we teach to mastery, right? And for students with learning disabilities, it's going to take them maybe 40 repetitions where it might take the typical learner four repetitions. We have to teach to mastery. And then continually assess formative assessment so while you're in the classroom so that we can see how these things are working just an example so we have student a who has dyslexia has a decoding issue so they're having trouble reading the words and the student scores high in originality flexibility elaboration convergent thinking so what could you do you could do peer reading partner them with a really strong reader and they're read, alternating paragraphs reading aloud. That has been a proven evidence-based technique. But then have the students come up with multiple scenarios for the ending. That student that has elaboration as a strength, a creative strength is really gonna shine in that area, even though in the reading part, they might not be so strong. So you're gonna compare their strength with their um, need. If they have, their, Student B has dyslexia, has a fluency issue, but they're high in risk-taking, originality, extrinsic motivation. Reader's theater um, is a great way to bring out that originality, risk-taking behavior. They would love to, to continually practice reading a story over and over until they could act it out in front of a group. So a student with dysgraphia, with scores high in convergent thinking and fluency. Um, give them an object, such as a thimble, and ask them to come up with as many uses of that object as possible, um, and provide that student that has high convergent thinking as the thought leader and have them lead the group. And then we're gonna ask them to write. That's their, the thing that they're working on, but again, we're using their strength to support their need and also providing assistive technology. So things like pencil grips, which are really helpful for kids with dysgraphia or speech to text. We know their thoughts are in there. Sometimes the physical writing is the problem. And so offering them some assistive technology. And there's also some software out there that can help them put their ideas on paper. And then in math, if they have trouble sequencing, let's say, but their scores are high in convergent thinking and extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation being the key, right? They like the reward. So if they're having trouble sequencing, you give them different size objects. And here we have an M&M and a cookie. Can they put those in order of size if you have different things? And then guess what the reward is at the end? They can eat their sequencing. Um, so you want to figure out ways as the teacher to bring in their creative strengths to help support their academic needs. And then just a quote by Dr. Seuss, 
Think left and think right and think low and think high. Oh, the thinks you can think up if only you try. Um, so I will open it up with Freddie. So oh, before I leave, I'll leave this up for a little bit. So the publisher has given us a 20% discount. If some of the things excite you about what we were talking about today, that there's a code for a 20% discount off the book when it's available, it looks like November it's going to be out. So you'll want to write down that code FLR40 should you decide you want that book. Uh, thank you, Lori. Um, the current plan is to hold all questions until after we hear from uh, Freddie Reisman, at which time we'll probably have a good 10 to 15 minutes to address questions, provide clarifications, et cetera, to, uh, to the two presentations. So unless there's an immediate clarification question needed uh, or question that needs to be addressed, I'm going to ask that you jot any other questions down in the chat room, which I'll be monitoring and ask Dr. Reisman to share her comments, thoughts, reactions to uh, what Dr. Sarah Verino just shared. Dr. Reisman? You're on mute though. Don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> Laurie, as usual, um, I've really enjoyed what you have to say. We have had a great time writing this book, working together. Um, I, I have a, a question in terms of the disconnect between the time that students spend on their academics and on creativity. And I'd like to share a story from when I was at the University of Georgia and I was supervising our students in their field experience, in their student teaching. And in Georgia, all of a sudden, and uh, it, I mean, we all have trouble with standardized testing, I know that. But in Georgia, they decided that they were gonna have a reading test and that uh, kids would progress to the next grade or not, depending upon how they did on this reading test. And our students were very upset. And so I was supervising students at one school and we problem solved. We said, all right, let's see how we can get around this. And we came up with the idea that for the, the most of the year, they would teach creatively. They would have, for example, if, if the story dealt with satin, these kids, they didn't know what satin was. So our teachers would buy some satin at the material store, let the kids feel it. And, and there were many of those kinds of activities that were creative and fun. And they did that for the whole year and according to my directions and support, two weeks before the exam, they would teach to the exam. And my students were in grades three, five, and six at the school. And the kids in their classroom where they taught just, you know, fun and, and uh, creative activities for the bulk of the year. And then the last two weeks, they just pushed and talked to the test. Their students did as well as the students of the classes of the teachers that taught to the reading test all year. So, you know, we, we are very upset with standardized testing and this event, but there are creative ways to get around standardized testing. Lori, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering, has anyone done any research looking at whether que uh, equations are easier to read than normal reading for those with dyslexia? And so that's a good question. I don't know of any studies that have specifically looked at that. Um, I do know that 
when there are word problems, they're just as difficult for kids with dyslexia. Um, equation, so if, if a student, from my experience teaching, um, if a student had strictly dyslexia and didn't have any math issues, they excelled in math. Um, so I have a five-year-old grandson that we're pretty sure is dyslexic. Um, you put a letter in front of him, he runs and he cries and he says, this is too hard. And you put a number in front of him and he's happy to tell you all about it. He's happy to add numbers together. He's happy to count things. He's happy to do all those things. No issue on the number math side. Um, so my thinking is that if they don't have a math disability, and it's really only in the reading sec part that equations are going to be easier for them. They're not gonna have that difficulty because they're not having to associate letters and sounds and words. Well, this might be an interesting um, little activity to do with Noah. I know her grandson and he's adorable. <laughs> uh, uh, to um, develop some <clears throat> very <clears throat> easy equations <clears throat> that, <clears throat> sorry, that relate to um, a story. Like for example, actually get some apples and, and show him that um, here are five apples, take away two and ask him how many are left and then put it into an equation of five minus two equal three, have him read the equation and then have words that relate to the equation and see if he can read the words. And maybe that going from an equation, well, from going a concrete uh, example of the equation to the equation, to the word equivalent of the equation, and, and it would be interesting to just see if there, there's any uh, relationship there. Good idea. Um, <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a bit about motivation. Uh, when I was at Syracuse <clears throat> as a grad assistant, my job was to work with the students who were referred to the math clinic who had uh, problems in, in math. And I mainly had middle school boys referred to me and they didn't want to be with this lady. And so my office was on the fourth floor and the uh, candy and soda machines were in the basement. So we would go down and they would pick out what they wanted. We'd come back to my office and I would start asking them about themselves. What were their interests? What games did they play? Were they into basketball or soccer or whatever? And I'd get them talking about themselves and they were munching on their candy and their soda. And then I'd slip a simple uh, computation item. And I'd say, hey, do this for me, will you? And they would do it. And they'd get it right because it was very easy. And I would give them another one that might have been a little bit more difficult. And then I would keep it at an easy level. I, I would never go to a, a difficulty where, where they would be uh, frustrated. And so finally, uh, where they were having a lot of success, many of them would say to me, hey, give me another one. And it just showed that if we give youngsters a chance to succeed, then their intrinsic motivation takes over. Now, um, there's a, a professor at Harvard, her name is Teresa Amabile, and she has written books and her whole research has been on intrinsic motivation. And she kind of tosses out extra extrinsic motivation, where uh, a, an external reward 
is, is involved, either salary or grades or um, just, a, a, oh, you did great. But she worked with the corporate people and she said that the more creative products were developed when intrinsic motivation was involved, when they were doing the job for the love of the job, for, for just the, the sake of the job. Well, I didn't find that to be true. And I thought back to the work with the kids at the Syracuse Math Clinic, where I had to give them extrinsic motivators. I had to give them some kind of reward, let it be candy and, and soda, whatever. And then I would hook them on the task, they would start to have success. And I could just see the turn from extrinsic to intrinsic motivation. Well, it's interesting in her last, last book that she did with her husband, she now is realizing and accepting the role of extrinsic motivation as a first step that then leads to intrinsic motivation. Well, I think that's true. I think we want to get kids to be intrinsically motivated, but when they struggle with learning something, sometimes the extrinsic helps them get through that. And that's where the teacher is so pivotal in knowing how to scaffold. So like you were talking about, starting with the things they could be successful with and then giving them more difficult problems. And when they have success with that, they want to keep going. Right, so scaffolding, and then also knowing, like Vygotsky would say, the tension. Knowing when to give enough tension and, not, and, and knowing that you, you crossed the line as the teacher, you frustrated this child. So you have to know all of your kids and you have to know how you can, who you can really push on and who you need to really support. And that's the skill of teaching. That's why teachers are so critical in the classroom? Uh, uh, I, I hope I'm not throwing a curve at you, Lori, but I wondered if you might talk a little bit about the Wilson program where you are a, a Wilson expert. And also, I'd love to hear about the iPad app <laughs> you've developed. Well, I'll be quick because I know we want to let people ask some questions too. Um, so the Wilson is a specific um, strategy to teach kids with dyslexia that really have that trouble with decoding and hearing sounds and putting them into words and reading the words and spelling the words. So it's a step-by-step -step, um, program that teaches to mastery. So we talked about that earlier. Um, it's really the gold standard for kids with dyslexia in helping them learn to read. And it does exactly that. It scaffolds and it gives them enough practice and they have to reach mastery before they can learn the next concept. Um, that's key. And then the app, um, we are still in the pilot phases, but we have um, created a, a, actually a web base now. We went away from just the iPad because a lot of schools are using Chromebooks um, where we are looking at, we use in our pilot studies and just in the validation process, we're using functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is um, a brain scan that goes on the forehead and can determine um, how much oxygenation is happening while they're reading the passage and while they're answering the questions and whether they get the questions right or wrong. So we use that to help validate, to take out test bias, right? So we wanna make sure that you had to read the passage to answer the question, not your personal experience and your background knowledge um, to be able to answer the question. So, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that um, so far so good, the pilot has been successful and we're coming up with great validation. So we'll continue to work on that expanding across the US and then um, hopefully it will, it will go to market. That's great. That's, uh, that's really exciting. Uh, for those of you who are interested in hearing more about uh, 
the brain and, and uh, aspects of neurology and teaching and learning, you might want to hear Dr. Kristen Betts, uh, I think it's tomorrow, uh, in the, uh, the Torrance Roundtable. I'd like to turn it over to our uh, moderator, Dr. Kaiser. Well, thank you, Dr. R. And thank you again, Laurie. Um, again, Kristen Betts will be speaking tomorrow as part of the inaugural uh, Kaufman Family Research Symposium, um, but we'll talk about that in a bit. I've been monitoring the chat room. There's not really a question, just a kind of a comment um, made by um, Melissa, uh, who wonders whether extrinsic motivation or the fact that the candy and the soda provided a safe zone, a, a happy zone, and that safety allowed intrinsic motivation to occur would be kind of important. Um, I actually- I think that's probably true. I find it fascinating that, you know, that at an early age, something about the coding process separates letters from numbers. I, to me, because they're both symbols and they're both, you know, I, I don't understand how the brain could actually make that connection. But again, that's why, you know, they have the, the, the issue. Um, right, right. Uh, and but also, like this comment on Melissa that she's been using the RDCA as a teaching tool for two years, that's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about how that's going? I can, um, and Dr. Reisman, uh, whenever I had Dr. Reisman for class and was exposed to the RDCA, I am a, I'm a 25 year old, I'm a 20, I wish I was 25 years old, <laughs> hold on a second. I'm a 25 year veteran teacher. Um, I taught music, general music, theater, um, band and orchestra and strings for 15 years. Um, then I lost my music job and I, I had an elementary cert just because you know, I'm a music teacher because you know it's coming, swings the pendulum. And I found myself laid off and offered a sixth grade English position. And um, so I, I went back and went crazy learning how to be a, a reading and writing teacher because I mean, I had the certificate, but you know how it is when you don't really do it. Well, then I stumbled upon um, the EDD program here at Drexel and Dr. Reisman's art and Dr. Kaiser with the RDCA. And I suddenly realized that um, I have a number aversion in a big way. Um, and I've had it my whole life, which has really held me back. Um, and I see it in my students. I have become a co-teacher, um, which means I teach with a special education teacher. Half of my students have individual education plans and our diagnosis special ed and the rest of my kids are quote unquote normal, whatever that means. Um, what I have found is that I have had extreme success with my special education students because I just simply teach them like a musician um, and that really works for them. So what I, when I discovered the RDCA and I realized what, where I was coming from and that I actually had an intelligence and it wasn't my, that the school was measuring, but I'm like, oh, look at me, I actually can do stuff. Um, and what I did was I took, I, at the time I was in an international baccalaureate school and we have the international, the IB curriculum is, it, it's in a public school, we used it. It's really the RDCA in my mind and Dr. Reisman and I kind of collaborated on this a little bit and you know, she's like, yeah, Melissa, I see it too. So what I did was I took it and I tweaked the RDCA and I broke it up um, because uh, Dr. Kaiser and Dr. Reisman and the, the, the paper had, you know, you can put them, they're all mixed up when you do the RDCA, but you know, I can see what, which ones they go to. So what I did is I used it as a teaching tool and I talked to my students about these were our learner attributes and we all have them. And it's a matter of the day because they change by the day. Right. They're not set in stone. And this is what we learned in my classroom for two years. And I teach in a Title I school in, in Annapolis, Maryland, in the city. My students are in trauma. My students are incredibly creative. My students are incredibly gifted and they're absolutely misdiagnosed for sure. And right. what I found was when the students and I learned where they sat on that, we could start collaborating together in our strengths and it happened very naturally. We knew what we weren't good at and we knew who was good at it. So now the collaboration happened and when, as a teacher, if you just get out of the way right. <laughs> and the kids have these tools and they know yeah. themselves, they will tell you what they need. And through the whole process, I learned that literally numbers make me 
so, uh, the feeling is so negative that it took a long time for me to see the usefulness in numbers. And it wasn't until I had a college statistics class at Drexel. And I was like, oh, zero, one, two, negative one, negative two. Yeah, I can see the usefulness in that, but that's really all I needed is numbers. And still to this day, I don't need the numbers. I'm, I'm glad for the statistics software. I know it sounds crazy, right? But they just, they just help me say that my intuition was right. That's a feeling that creative people get away from and you will never teach a kid math who is not intrinsically motivated because they read that problem and come up with 20 different questions. It just doesn't, it's just not how we're, they're wired. They're, it's a fake problem. They have no motivation to solve a fake problem. They see through that. Give them a real problem, no right. problem. So that I, I used it as a tool, taught it in increments. Um, I, I developed 11 areas that we studied and we attached them to just being a good human being and it worked. And this is something that I'm refining and continuing to use. Sorry, I'm very excited awesome. about it. I'll, I'll That's stop. awesome. I love it. And I love your excitement, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Chris made a comment in the in the chat room that instrumental music teachers very often spot dyslexia early through music reading, and that's a common uh, first uh, sign. It's uh, common that first signs emerge via music lessons. There, I noticed <clears throat> there was a question: uh, Do adults have dyscalculia? Yes. Um, yeah. It's it's not only developmental but it stays with you, with us. Yeah, it, it's the same with the learning disability doesn't go away. You can Circum learn to, you, yeah, you can, you can make things easier for yourself if you have good instruction, but you're still gonna have those aspects of it through your whole life, yeah. Lori, I found it fascinating when you talked about entrepreneurs having certain creative strengths that are not, uh, identified in managers do you, i mean that i'm going to have to really explore as i develop this <laughs> masters in entrepreneurship and uh, creativity but what do you happen to know what those specific characteristics are offhand uh i'd have to pull up the study lair um i'm trying to remember what they were but it was like thinking outside the box coming up with different ways to solve problems um, those were the big ones that I remember, but I'm sure there was a list of things that, that they saw in themselves. So that's yeah. I'll be contacting you for that research. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, fascinating. Chris, I think, did you wanna... we, I think we need to explain that Dr. Kaiser also teaches for the entrepreneurial school at Drexel. <laughs> um, well, that is there. Any other questions? If so, please unmute. We have another moment or two. Um, uh, yes, I had one quick question. Um, Dr. Severino, how you doing? How's everybody doing? This is Dr. Scott. Um, I asked a question about, um, um, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, dyscalcia. Dyscalculia or dyscalcula? Either one is fine. Okay, dyscalcula. <laughs> But um, not dyscalculia, as I call it. <laughs> okay, dyscalculia, right, in, in adults. Um, I'm just asking because um, as you, awesome presentation, by the way, both you, Dr. Reisman, awesome. Um, just as, as Melissa was talking, I was thinking, and um, it's weird. I kind of have an aversion of numbers, but I can get an A in a math course. But if you put, if you put a... a problem with words i hate it no. that's why on standardized tests i blank out but if i'm in class and i can see the equations i get right. it but if you put the word problem in front of me i can't get it and it's just that i don't know what happens and i, I kind of got this aversion so I, that's why i was asking that like maybe can you have mild form of of okay yeah, okay. you can. You, and you can, it sounds to me like it's not a math issue for you. It might be the the word issue and how how it's supposed to go together. And but yes, you can have a very mild case um, of of any of them, and okay. you can have a very severe case. There's every every child is different, every person is different. Yes. Um, and, and it affects them kind of 
different ways. And okay. Scott, yes. uh, in, in Lori and my book, we have just hundreds of activities that you can uh, use to help you get around the problem with the words and, and your strength in the equation. Okay. How you can use the equation, which has a lot of meaning. An equation has minimal symbols and maximum meaning. Yes. And, and uh, it, what you're describing is a very pervasive uh, thing that many people have. Okay. I, I will share that I drive Dr. Kaiser crazy when we work together because he is very elaborative. He just expounds and I am very minimal. And it's a very interesting difference in learning style and in uh, performance style. And we've just learned to coexist. <laughs> Better than that, we make it work. Um, That's right. Uh, I'm, you, we need to end to take a break before the, uh, the next meeting, uh, but Wendy had a question about, is there any resource you can, uh, they can go to to find out whether as an adult, they might have dyslexia that has not previously been diagnosed? So I'm gonna turn that over to Maria Toglia, who I see on here, who is, um, she is head of the Pennsylvania International Dyslexia Association. Um, and they have resources on your page, do you not, Maria? Yes, um, it, it's absolutely possible to find out if you have dyslexia as an adult. Um, it does require um, a bit of an assessment, but also just meeting with someone who's an expert and talking with them about the struggles that you have had can really help um, folks understand their own learning pr profiles and, and whether or not the types of things they struggle with are consistent with dyslexia. So I would go to the International Dyslexia Association website and there are many, many resources available as well as the Pennsylvania branch of the International Dyslexia website. There are people out there that can help and many, many adults with dyslexia who can tell their stories. And um, it's reassuring to know that many people, like you've said, Lori, have been very successful um, despite having struggled with dyslexia all their lives. Right. Thank you, Maria. And I'd like to thank again our keynoter, Dr. Lori Severino and our panelist, Dr. Freddie Reisman for sharing this interesting information with us this morning slash this afternoon, again, depending on where you are. And I invite them to rejoin us after this half hour break and rejoin us for the E. Paul Torrance Roundtable on Creative Thinking, where we will have four um, keynote talks related to the Creativity Thinking Roundtable theme, 70 Years of Research into Creativity, Reflections on J.P. Guilford's APA Presidential Address, where her, we will hear from Dorothy Sisk, Ron Baghetto, Kay Kim, uh, and just a note that the original planned fourth keynoter, Mark Ronco, is, has been ill and recuperating and he's not able to participate today. But I am pleased to share that the creativity expert and entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneur, uh, Rick Cantor, will speak in his stead. So uh, I will see you back here in 25 minutes if you leave or if you just uh, blank out your screen if you have to go. Um, but again, thank you so much, and we will see you shortly. Thank you all. That was terrific, Lori and Dr. R. Thank you. <laughs> Good, that was fun. Lori, you were great. Thank you. Yeah, so were you really, ready really, as always? Excellent. I'm excellent just responding. Job. I don't know if Gertrude's still on here. Is she still on? Yeah, she is. Uh, or if she she might have stepped away though, but I want to respond. This is her. being recorded, so they will hear it. So okay. don't forget to share. So she asked um, people who are told they're stupid, how do they find the courage to speak to a professional about dyslexia? So those professionals about dyslexia understand that struggle. Uh, I mean, in my 35 years working in this field, 
um, we understand. Um, and it's going to be much better to talk to somebody that understands dyslexia because they know it has nothing to do with stupidity or laziness, that it's a neurological issue. So if they know about dyslexia, they know you've been told that and they know that's not the truth. So find comfort in that. And, um, you know, I'm happy to speak to anybody about that also. So if anybody has more questions, feel free to reach out. Absolutely. I would also add, Lori, that it's often an in incredible relief when people finally um, talk to someone who understands what they've been going through and can put words to what it is that they've yeah. been experiencing. Um, they, it, it's a tremendous relief for them because they now have an understanding of why certain things were so difficult and um, it, it opens up a whole new, it opens something up yeah. for them. Yeah, um, it's a relief actually. So, amazing so relief. many parents that when I had students that I would have meetings with the parents about their child and I would start to explain, you know, what's happening in the brain and this is why they're having trouble. And they would say, this sounds exactly like me. So people found out they were dyslexic as an adult because they had a meeting about their child who was dyslexic. So, um, right. yeah, it happens, happens quite often. Oh, wow. Rico. I noticed that you had a raised hand um, that I was I didn't notice before. Uh, did you have a question that you wanted to ask the panel while they're still here? I, Knowing that I, you're on mute, that if you do have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear yeah, you now. I'll, okay. Well, I'm wondering because sometimes I want to put a, a, a cup on the table only to find that I've put it on the edge and it has broken. Is that a sign of dyslexia or I, I thought I put it where I want to put it, but then I've missed the spot. Does that go to show I have dyslexia? So not necessarily. However, I have just been researching this myself um, with that there is, and I didn't know this before, so always learning, um, there's a condition, developmental coordination disorder. And wow. so there's a high link between developmental coordination and dyslexia, which I did not know before. Um, so if you kind of bump into things or if you, you know, you think things are somewhere and you're putting, and you know, people would call that clumsy. But it's yes. actually, it's a, actually a coordination disorder. That and should they, be. They've, ten, they've found that there's a connection between dyslexia and that. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. I, I have a question for you. Uh, when you walk through doors, do you sometimes hit against the edge of the door instead of being right in the middle? Hey, that's right, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I um, have had a, one, one a college student in particular when I was still at the University of Georgia who shared that with me. And it's a spatial uh, situation where you um, are putting your body in space correctly. And so it sounds to me uh, like, like there's a spatial uh, involvement here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mathematics is very spatial. Um, it's abstract. When you abstract, for example, threeness out of a set of three or fiveness or whatever, the, the, the fiveness takes up more space than the three. And so I find that people, uh, and, and this relates to the question, can adults have dyscalculia? Uh, I find that people who have problems with mathematics very often have spatial uh, issues with their body in space. And so a lot of times just being aware of that 
and engaging in metacognition where you say, okay, what's your first name? No, no, four. N O N O four. Okay. N uh, All right, Dr. N O. <laughs> uh, if you, if you uh, are aware of these things and you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to walk through the middle of the door. Uh, this cognitive monitoring is a real good tool to offset spatial orientation situations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's illuminating. Now I know I'm, I'm normal, normal, half normal. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And Rachel, did you have a question? And you're on mute, uh, so I can't hear you. No, no question. Oh, okay. No question. <laughs> I see Debbie has joined us. Hello, Debbie. Hello. <laughs> Ah, so good to see you. Good to see you. In your beautiful yellow room. I, you know, <laughs> yes. If Chris and Wilson is down, we have another musician with us now. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't get on earlier. Well, I was on earlier, but just right now. I note that Ron uh, is on too. I'm not sure if he's still in Australia, but I believe that's where he used to hail. I thought of him recently as I was going through my summer uh, t-shirts, where I believe that one of the presentations <laughs> you gave a while ago, many years ago at one of the KIE conferences, you gave out the t-shirts that had the uh, uh, the uh, light bulb with light creativity bulb. underneath, mm. which Ideas. I still wear. It's fantastic. I'll, when you wear it out, I'll send you another one. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. Uh, are you still in Australia? I am. Yes, it's uh, it's almost midnight here, so I'm uh, lasting it out as long as I can. <laughs> Was hoping to get there for the conference this year, but unfortunately, as circumstances prevailed. But yes, I I will get over to see you guys sometime as soon as it's over. As soon as Man, you're all healthy again. <laughs> Um, I wonder if David is still with us or whether he's uh, gone to take a nap. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still with you, but uh, not absolutely 100%. <laughs> I hear you. So when did you head to Mexico? Um, we, well, I, I, we were here for Christmas. No, for New Year. For New Year, and we never really left. I went back to the UK for February and the floods and the rain were so terrible. I I came back again. Because I was. <laughs> I'm just wondering if anyone can put the link for the RDCA on the chat. I I was writing it down when Lori was speaking, but I didn't write fast enough, and I don't think I have the the whole link. But I would I would love to to take it myself. <laughs> okay, um, let me see if I can get that. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear that. While Larry's finding that, Debbie, could you tell a little bit about your program for students? Um, the, the Kids Compose program, the one I spoke on, yeah, I sp uh, spoke on that earlier, very early here uh, this morning. Um, sure. Uh, so we, I work with kids just uh, with music composition 
a lot in order to uh, cultivate their creativity and um, do all sorts of things from, well, I do a lot of uh, music educator, like uh, teacher training, but getting in the classroom and working with the kids and, and um, just with various uh, diverse number of ways to really generate uh, using music as a way of expressing their creativity and, and getting in touch with that. Uh, it was interesting, a lot of the questions I had this morning were from people in cultures who don't necessarily have written music. So that was a really fascinating, uh, different way for me to think about um, too, as I was answering their questions and thinking about that, that we are so structured here um, with uh, the notation and, and that really does limit, I think. I think it's, it's something that they do so much more naturally um, and here, sometimes we squelch that by saying, this is what you have to do in order to make music. And whereas uh, a lot of what I do with the kids, uh, different things like uh, taking inspiration from nature or, or from just everyday existence and, and creating music and art out of that is stuff that they naturally do. And so um, that was a really interesting aspect of of the discussion, uh, I guess, a couple hours ago, a few hours ago, when we were talking about that. But um, I don't know, anything specific uh, as far as what you would want me to speak about? I mean, I do, uh, we do competition and we, we take um, students, uh, submit melodies and, and, um, we connect them with small chamber ensembles of instruments so that they can take their music and hear it in the different ways with different timbres and just expand uh, their palette of, well, of understanding possibilities of what music can be and how that can relate to, you know, like I said, nature or to um, just every aspect of life. I have a really interesting project I'm in the middle of right now. And just stop me if you need me to stop talking. I didn't know if we're just have some extra time here. But um, that comes from, I had an experience in February, a student of mine was very excited about um, when I came in and talked to her, she was writing a project for Black History Month on Mark E. Dean. So immediately my brain went to Mark E. Dean and seeing that in music, so I had to write it down and underline the letters that are in the musical alphabet, which are, you think about Mark, E, Dean, A, E, D, E, A, which is a perfect, um, well, it's very, it's uh, symmetrical, this, this little obligato that um, now I'm having a bunch of people improvise on, and she composed with those notes, and it's, it's A minor, it's like, it's, it's a perfect thing that, that just so happened out of this guy's name and the way it lined up. And so, you know, that was a random thing that I'm talking about right now, but just a really interesting connection that she got so excited. Now I have these other people doing some things. And um, another project I just Hello. did was, uh, you Hello. know, doing some yeah. uh, uh, story, like having a book read and putting some music to that. So, I mean, just hey, what about that that that? music, creativity and art, you know, yeah, sure, and I didn't do. various aspects of life. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Chris, you and Debbie need to get together. She has a, a, just had some fantastic stories that I-, I Again, Debbie, nice to see you. Hey, good to see you, yeah. We, we met last year, um, Freddie, in uh, Southern Oregon. Ah. Uh, I had yeah. the great pleasure to hear her perform with her family. Well, that was something, yeah. That was good. I can't remember what I did there. 
Are you are you presenting on this conference this year? Uh, no, I was due to be speaking this morning, but for various reasons. Well, I look forward to just a moment. I... Rachel, uh, you're you're not on mute, so if you're okay. uh, I just want to make sure sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> And Chris, if you have Debbie, uh, Debbie sent to me, and I shared it with uh, a couple of our faculty members, a, a beautiful project on uh, reading and music. Um, Debbie, you want to talk about that a bit? I, I just found it fascinating. It was so, so well done. Well, okay, so um, I had some, of, as we went into this global pandemic time period, um, some music teachers reached out to me and just said, do you have any online content? Because, you know, it's such a hands-on and it's a hard thing really to, to go online, especially, you know, suddenly like that. And so I've been playing with a few um, different things, but one of the projects that I, I completed um, was there's a children's book uh, called Zin Zin Zin, A Violin. And it is actually a counting book uh, from one to 10, but it counts in musical instruments from solo to a chamber group of 10. And so um, it is, it, it just lines up perfectly. You know, we start with the trombone playing solo and then they add the various instruments. So I actually arranged uh, variations on Pop Goes a Weasel that took the instrumentation that followed the storyline and then I had, you know, the arms of friends and family all over um, and had them all uh, record their various parts. So we put that together and a dear friend of mine, uh, Marietta Simpson, who is an opera star, um, fabulous, fabulous, um, read the story and we put the variations under that. And then um, I did a companion uh, actually, my son edited it together, who you met last year also. Um, he put together this companion video that introduced the musicians and their, um, stop all my extraneous noises there, um, the, their uh, instruments and the musicians. And so they are from, you know, I have one who's in Germany and one who's in Can from Canada. And so they, they talked about that and they did little things with their um their instruments that were really fun. I, I played a couple excerpts from that in my talk this morning. And it, it just, it, it is a really fun thing. And you know, the value of it for teachers, of course, they don't want to just be playing videos all the time, but um, hopefully with the way that it turned out, uh, there is just that ability to, um, you know, we've got the counting, we've got the exposure and the different timbres of the instruments, but also like with the, the melody itself, Pop the Goes the Weasel has different treatments from, you know, it's in minor one time, it's in three, four, I put it in four, four, you know, like as a musician, I know you understand the, the different things. And then just the different instrumentation and thickness uh, from that. So there, there are a lot of ways to have a discussion, hopefully, you know, um, with what was put together. And, you know, so it was fun. It was, definitely a challenge all of these zoom type of things and online and and coordinating with people it's wow what a world right now right but um it was fun and and we're hoping to do a few more things like that um open to any suggestions that people have of things to to throw together and and really help out because it certainly looks like at least some people are going to be online this fall um already and more are probably gonna be joining them so trying to get good quality content that generates sparks ideas and you know different things so but yeah it was a fun fun project sounds absolutely amazing um i'm sorry i missed this morning but um yeah on on the subject of music study online it's been incredible uh, the last three or four months the the real concern in the uk and i think in some other countries is this notion of next year for certain key groups of students we're going to have to really focus on what really matters and in the uk the debate is therefore we'll have to sideline uh, the arts music drama um, and focus on what really matters which is maths and writing which is the subject of um this afternoon's discussion so it's it's it's, it's worrying times but at the same time um i know a lot of people teaching uh, um pupils instruments on online 
and the range of new skills they've developed and made it work in the space of weeks is is just extraordinary it can be done and it works really well it can be i have a few students that i've continued because i went from a full studio i just do a few um lessons online each week and i find i am so exhausted <laughs> afterwards because you have to listen and just to understand was that you know like each challenge to yourself did i hear that note wrong? like especially over whatever was that you know a flat instead of a natural you know like or just those types of things and then how to express um what because so much is by example and some of that just doesn't quite go over so you really are learning new ways to communicate and um draw that out of the students it's it's fascinating but i look forward to putting those techniques into practice in person again that's for sure Prince, is it possible to educate your government to realize that mathematics and music are two sides of the same coin? Uh, seemingly not, unfortunately, Freddie, despite a lot of people's very uh, concerted efforts. I'm sorry. Uh, our education secretary um, mandated that schools uh, moved back again to rows of students facing the front of class. Um, having adjusted for more uh, sort of social in, in, models, the, the amount of um, uninformed decision making about education remains startlingly high, not just in the UK, I fear. Mm. That's unfortunate. I can't tell you how sad I am to hear that, Chris. <laughs> I, well, it, it's it's interesting, of course, um, private schools and very expensive schools wouldn't dream of dropping anything. Um, but state schools, uh, schools subject to UK government mandate and control, um, are, are pushed into a difficult place because they're, they're measured against key performance relating to those core subjects because they matter more, etc. And it's, it's a tyranny that goes round and round in circles, unfortunately. Well, maybe they should try what I did at Georgia by little story about the reading and how they did creative teaching all year. And then the last two weeks they taught to the test and their kids came out just as well as the teachers who taught to the test all year. It's, it's the, it's the, the problem of, um, subjects becoming these silos and uh, I, I put, popped a note in the chat that there will be dozens of amateur darts players confidently subtracting complex numbers and working out doubles and triples who in their math school uh, studies at school were incapable they found it difficult and couldn't do it so therefore they can't do maths the, the same is true for uh, drummers who, who, who are dealing with highly complex rhythmic structures and numerical structures go back to the maths classroom um, why can't you study maths through sports? Why can't you study maths through music? I couldn't agree with you more. Shame. Perhaps, I don't know, but from my own experience, after the volcanic crisis, or should I say during the volcanic crisis, or even before that, when we had Hurricane Hugo, that was when all the creativity flowed. And things that teachers thought that they could not have done in, during normal school hours, that's what we had to do during the time when we had no schools at all because 99% of the buildings were down. But still, we learned and we taught. So, and the creativity that came out then was so amazing that even after the, the crisis, people were still using those same methodologies in their classroom. So perhaps if something serious happens, <laughs> God forbid, <laughs> that's what, what will jerk people into reality. But I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Montserrat is no stranger to crisis. It's always having one disaster after another. But schooling, teaching, and learning have never suffered because there were always these creative ideas of how to deliver. And the students were even more creative than the teachers. We learned from them. It was, it was a, a, a place where the teacher is the learner and the learner is the teacher. So a lot of creativity happened then. So perhaps, and like it's happening now in the lockdown, 
I tried to put that point across in my, my presentation this morning. That's exactly what's happening now in the lock, during the lockdown. So maybe that's in crisis that we see creativity come to the fore. Well, that's certainly my hope, uh, Gertrude. Um, it, it, again, at least in the U.S., it, there's a real opportunity, particularly you know, in some of the, the places that will not be doing state testing or that type of assessment next year that the teachers will be free are freed up to become more innovative and more creative in, in their instructional practices. 